My name is Patty Bernard. I'm a member of the Nevada Women's History Project. This is Saturday, May 6th. We are at the Border Inn, which is just a whisper east of the Nevada-Utah border. Actually, we're in Utah, but if we walk 20 feet, we're going to be in Nevada. This is a part of a series of the John Ben Snow Memorial Trust, um, which is interviewing women along Highway 50. And Highway 50 has traditionally been called the loneliest road in America. I am interviewing Gretchen Baker, um, who lives in Baker. And Gretchen, uh, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, we're at a hotel room at the Border Inn, which is about six miles from Baker, Nevada. And that's about 350 to 400 miles from the Nevada-California border. We're actually right here on the Utah-Nevada border. And I first came to Baker, Nevada in 2001 with a job with the National Park Service to help restore Bonneville cutthroat trout at Great Basin National Park. And I remember driving along Highway 50 to get here and I pulled into Baker and the first thing I noticed was all the trailers and the tires on the, the roofs holding the, them down and um, it was a little desolate for me. I had never been to this area before and I wasn't too sure that I wanted to stay. Um, I went up into the national park and my mind changed because it was beautiful up there. And um, I found that I really enjoyed the job and over time I really came to like the town of Baker too. So that's how I first arrived here in Baker. Can you tell me a little bit about your uh, family and your education that enabled you to come here to work for the Park Service? Sure, I uh, grew up in a little town called Rensselaer, Indiana, and I uh, started at college at Rosary College near Chicago, and after my sophomore year of college, um, my roommate gave me an application to apply for the National Park Service, and I filled it out and got a job at Jewel Cave in South Dakota. And I spent many times or many seasons going to different national park units, and I loved it. And I wanted to keep working for the National Park Service, but I was tired of working seasonal jobs where I had to move every six months. And so I applied for a longer term job. And so the job that I got was supposed to last three to four years here at Great Basin National Park. And um, so when I came, I was that's what I was planning to stay just for a few years out here. Um, I worked for resource management um, and I had to go back to school in between different seasons to get a master's of science and environmental science so that I would have the education necessary to do the job. That's really interesting. Did you have a science interest always growing up? I, I liked playing outdoors, but I wasn't particularly scientific. Um, at least that I can remember, but I, I liked being outside and observing nature. And the job that I have now, I get to spend about half my time outside observing nature and doing small studies to, to better understand it. So it's, in a lot of ways, it's getting to be a kid all the time, but a little more paperwork. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your job when you first came here um, with the trout. Were so, so Bonneville cutthroat trout um, only come into a little tiny part of Nevada. Um, they lived in Lake Bonneville, which covered most of Utah, and then had little sections in, in the surrounding states. And um, they were basically thought to have been um, exterminated from many of the streams in this part of Nevada. Um, and a population had recently been found um, in Mill Creek, which is on the northern end of the park. And so we were working to expand that population into other streams in the park and then also assisting um, the Nevada Department of Wildlife with other projects in um, the northern snake range. And um, so my job was to go out and we'd take the fish shocker and we'd shock streams to see what fish were there. We would remove non-native fish and then we would put in the, the native Bonneville cutthroat trout and track how they were growing. What year was this and how successful has it been? So what we, um, I came in 2001, the project started in 1999 with a management plan. Um, and um, it's been a very successful project over the years. We've been able to reestablish Bonneville cutthroat trout to South Fork Baker Creek, Strawberry Creek, Snake Creek. Um, and uh, we've seen the populations grow 
considerably in, in all those. There have been some problems over the years. Um, Snake Creek had uh, brook trout. Uh, somebody put brook trout into the creek and so we had to go back and retreat that. And there was a fire last year in Strawberry Creek that wiped out a large part of the population, but we still did find some, some Bonneville cutthroat trout in that creek. What makes the compatibility uh, unfeasible to have several species in, in an area? So the non-native trout, um, like rainbow trout, will um, hybridize with the Bonneville cutthroat trout. And so then we don't have pure Bonneville cutthroat trout anymore. And the brown trout and the brook trout will just outcompete the uh, Bonneville cutthroat trout. And so they take over the habitat and there's nowhere left for the Bonneville cutthroat trout to live. Is this a game fish? Mm -hmm. Yes, it, Bonneville cutthroat can be caught and um, you can, it's the state limit so you can catch up to 10 a day. So most people, we encourage catch and release in the park for sure. So I started the, my job with uh, Great Basin National Park working with Bonneville cutthroat trout, but over the years my job evolved so that I was working on other projects. Um, and now I work a lot with the caves in the park. They're, are 40 caves in the park, including Lehman Caves, which is the one most people know about because people can go on tours through there. And uh, we've been studying what lives in the different caves in the park, and since 2002 um, have found 10 species that are new to science in the caves. Um, and this is with the help of cave biologists who've come in. Um, but we have six flies that are new to science. Um, I was lucky enough to have one of them named after me. <laughs> um, and then we have uh, two millipedes, uh, we have a little tiny springtail and an amphipod, um, which is like a freshwater shrimp that we only know from one cave in the park. Um, and so we study all those creatures and we're um, also looking at others. We have other potential things that are new to science that we just don't see very often, so it's hard to know um, a lot about them. Um, we also are doing climate studies in the caves because they occur from low elevations all the way up to the tops of mountains. Um, and some of those really high elevation caves are coated with ice year round. And so we have ice records in the caves. And so we're trying to learn more about that. And um, we, uh, th those caves are a lot of fun because we have to use ropes to go in and out of them. And so um, doing rope work at high elevation is a really good workout. Um, we have a Gloria project at the park and that's studying climate change on the mountaintops. And every five years we go to several different mountain peaks and we look at the vegetation that's on those peaks. Because the idea is as the climate gets warmer, the plants will move up the mountain trying to find those cooler conditions. But once it gets too warm, there won't be anywhere higher for them to go and so they'll just disappear. And so we're keeping track of that on four mountain peaks in the park. And that's a, that's a very fun project because we get botanists from all over Nevada to come and help with that. And um, it's also a great excuse to go climbing mountains, so we enjoy that a lot. Um, and then about um, eight years ago, I started a bioblitz at the park. And a bioblitz is when we have um, an expert and some citizen scientists come in to study something in depth. So the first year we looked at beetles and we wanted to find out what kind of beetles lived in the park. And we had people go in all different trails looking for beetles and then they brought them back and then we had the state entomologist for Nevada, um, Jeff Knight, identify those beetles and um, we found a, a whole lot more than we ever expected lived in the park. Um, so that was fascinating. And so we, we had so much fun with that. We've continued each year looking at other things like um, crickets and grasshoppers another year, uh, butterflies and moths another year. Um, last year was birds. This year we're looking at lichens. Um, and so we've had a lot of fun looking at these things that usually aren't studied, but for one weekend we put a, a lot of effort into it and we find um, a lot of things that are interesting in the park that m most people really hadn't given much thought to before. So well, that's been a, a very fun part of the job too. And then another thing I, I do within my job at Great Basin National Park now as the ecologist is I administer the scientific research permit system. And that allows me to work with researchers who want to stu do studies in the national park. And um, we, they send in applications and we review them and help them with logistics to get out to the study sites. And, and researchers are studying everything from um, how much ozone is in the air at the park to um, 
jumping spiders and what kind of species we might have there, um, to looking at the, the glacier and seeing um, how much glacier we have left in the park and what's left in the rock glaciers too. So it's a whole variety and that makes the job fun because every year we have, we have some researchers that come back every year and then we also have some new researchers that come. And, and so I work with people from all over the state, all over the country, and even other countries that want to do research in the park the National Park get a lot of additional funding that it wouldn't otherwise get. So several of the campgrounds have been rehabilitated with funding from that source. Um, we also are working on the various resource management programs to uh, restore the sagebrush and then I've got one that I just started this year to restore the basin wild rye grasslands in the park. It's a very small component of the park but we want these grasses that uh, can grow up to five feet high and that settlers reported coming in on horses and having it brush against their horse's belly to be restored a little bit more and be um, a bigger part of the ecosystem within the park. So these extra funds from that um, Sniploma fund source has allowed the park to have additional employees and uh, to upgrade resources within the park. And it's also helped, I think, to get a little more um, attention to the park. And one result of that has been an um, increase in popularity of Great Basin National Park. Um, recently, uh, there have been several articles that talk about some of the least known or least visited national parks in the country. And Great Basin consistently comes out as one of the top um, hidden gems within the National Park Service, which makes sense. It's a great national park. You have Wheeler Peak at over 13,000 feet high. You've got ancient bristlecone pines that can live thousands of years. You've got beautiful mountain lakes, a whole variety of different habitats. And then Lehman Cave, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, a fantastic cave that you get to see all these um, formation so close up. And so you have all that, plus you feel like you're visiting a national park that you have all to yourself. And so a lot of people are coming here now. And um, in the last five years, visitation has gone from 90,000 people per year to almost 150,000 people per year. So it's definitely, we see more people, especially in the summer coming. And um, it makes it a little harder to get into the cave. Reservations ahead of time make a lot of sense if you really want to go into Lehman Caves. Um, and in the, for camping in the campgrounds, they can be full on the weekends now. Um, so people have to sometimes go to other places in the park to camp, like up Snake Creek, which is also a fantastic place to go. I know that the, there are a lot of backpacking uh, that is done there. What's the extensive area that people can backpack to? Are there certain lakes that are popular amongst the the area that they can go from one to the other? Yes, so the most popular backcountry uh, route is a loop that goes from Baker to Johnson Lake and you can spend one or two or even more nights there um, and it's beautiful because uh, you get up to the lakes and there are mountain peaks all around. They're, they're glacial cirques basically and so you're in this spot surrounded with mountains on three sides and sometimes you can see bighorn sheep up there we don't have a whole lot in this area but the a few in the, the rocky mountain um, bighorn sheep so they're not found in many other parts of the state um, and it's just a, a very a beautiful experience of being out there in the backcountry um, and there are other routes too for people um, who want to go a little bit off trail, you can actually traverse the whole mountain range. Um, and that's a, a great, great experience. Um, there's some backcountry trails that go in the southern part of the park if you really want to get away from it all, um, where you might not see people for days or even weeks down there. Okay, so the first summer I was here at, um, in Baker, I went to a community barbecue over Labor Day weekend called the Snake Valley Days that the local volunteer fire department puts on. And while I was there, I noticed this um, young rancher that caught my eye and um, we started talking and um, it turned out that we were interested in each other and we had some other interests like being outdoors. And um, it, it was a little, um, little difficult at first because I was a government employee um, and he was a rancher, but we learned that we had enough in common that um, a few years later we got married. And so uh, Craig Baker is, is my husband's name, 
and he uh, is one of the co-owners of Baker Ranch, which is the largest ranch in this area. And um, we get asked a lot if we are the original Bakers. Um, I just like to say the town's named after me, but um, I've, yeah, not quite old enough for that. But um, it turns out that my husband's grandfather was from Delta, Utah, and when he was uh, a young man, he came out to work for the Bakers, and he fell in love with the area, and so later he bought some property, and eventually he bought the Baker Ranch. And so I think part of it could have been the, the name that attracted him, but he also really liked this area. So we're a different Baker family that has settled in, in Baker itself. Um, now, as um, I was asking my husband about these stories um, around the area and why certain things were called different things, um, he'd say, well, so-and-so told me this story. And I'm like, is it written down? And he's like, no. And I'm like, we need to write this stuff down because this is some important history. And so I started um, writing down the stories that my husband told me. And um, I came up with the idea that it would be really fun to write a guidebook for the area. And um, we started going and visiting different places uh, in, in the national park and the surrounding area um, and took notes on what we saw there and I took photographs of what we saw. Um, and I did a lot of research into the, the history and the geology and the biology of the area. But there were still a lot of questions I had. And so I started interviewing people and I interviewed over 20 people um, to find out more about um, how they had come to be in Baker, in the nearby area, and what their experiences were growing up here. And the result of it was um, a book published by Utah State University in 2012 called Great Basin National Park, A Guide to the Park and the Surrounding Area. And it was a tremendously fun book to, to research and write. Um, it definitely took a lot more time to edit and publish than I thought it would, but I, um, the end result is really good because now I can, whenever I have questions about things that happened, I don't have to keep it all in my head. I can say, I wrote that down. I'll just go look it up in the book. This is the book. I was so excited to finally get it published. Um, and it's full color, which made me very excited too, and has pictures of all the different areas in here and maps of how to get to different places. And, and so if you want to spend a couple of weeks in the Baker area, this book will show you what fossils to go look for and what warm springs you can visit and, and all sorts of hidden spots around the area. Gretchen, I, I, I can't even imagine publishing the book by myself under, that, under my own name. How did you feel when you first opened that box and you saw your book? And then did that give you impetus to do other kinds of writing? It felt wonderful to finally have that book done because I'd been working on it for so long. Um, so it was quite a relief and I was happy to, to show it around and um, I did some book signings. And then one of the um, local bookstores, the Western National Parks Association that has bookstores at the, the national park, um, the, the bookstore manager said, you know, we don't have anything for kids about the Great Basin. Why don't you write a book about kids, uh, for kids about the Great Basin? And I'm like, yeah, that's a great idea. That shouldn't take very long. You know, it might only take a weekend. Well, two years later, <laughs> I came up with another book, um, and this one was called The Great Basin for Kids, and um, it's also full color um, and uh, has 18 activities in it and maps about places to visit to see different things. Um, and it just starts off with what is the Great Basin because we found that a lot of people don't even know that the Great Basin includes most of the state of Nevada and then goes down into California and up into Oregon and over to Utah and even into Idaho. And so um, there's all sorts of fun activities in this book to help explain um, the Great Basin and then the features of the Great Basin, including the geology. Um, so we have the state fossil in here, the ichthyosaur. Um, and other places that you can go find fossils in the Great Basin. And so I learned so much when I did this book because it included more area than just my first book. And I also had two kids at this point. 
um, Matthew and Emma, and they helped me go out and explore and see things from a different point of view than I had ever seen before. And so that, that was a really fun experience um, doing this book. It also got me a little more into photography. I had been taking pictures, but with kids, I found that I really had to slow down when we went on hikes. And so a great way to slow down was to take a camera with. And so I really started doing more photography too. And so um, I, I keep taking photos and that's become a big hobby of mine too. Um, but I was also still writing in the background, and um, in 2016, I knew that the National Speleological Society was planning to hold their convention in Ely, Nevada. And the convention is when a thousand cavers all converge in one spot, and there are scientific talks, and there are um, artist workshops, and there are some big parties at night, and caving trips, and so a whole variety of things are going on at the convention. And I thought, oh, this could be an opportunity to write some fiction. And I could write some fiction about a murder mystery that takes place during the NSS convention in Ely. And so I actually wrote this story twice. The first time I didn't like it. So I started from scratch and rewrote the whole thing. And I ended up with an unconventional murder, a caving mystery. And um, I was a little shy about using my, my real name on this, so I used a pseudonym. And the pseudonym has a geology joke in it. Um, it's C.A. Cox. And C.A. is, um, if you think of what limestone is made of, uh, it's calcium carbonate. And so if you go to the periodic table, you have that C.A. for calcium and then carbonate is CO3. So I had to kind of work that into the, the, the name. So I, I'm really, the author is Cave. So <laughs> I, I had to just have some fun with that. So. Um, the writing and photography are giving me fun outlets for my, my creative impulses. Um, and it also gives me an excuse to, to go out and to investigate areas and, and see what's going on and, and just enjoy the being outdoors. Because I, I, I feel like I, when I go outdoors, I really am renewed and have more energy. In addition to your work at the park, Baker is a very small town. I'm going to assume that you have had to take an integral part in the county and the, and the city affairs. Um, I believe you are uh, with the fire, volunteer fire department. Can you talk a little bit about how you feel that you must support the community? Well, you know, some people think that if it's a small town, it's got to be boring. Um, there are weeks where I have a meeting every single night of the week because there's so much going on in, in town. Um, so w one of the things, um, I'm a volunteer firefighter and EMT for White Pine County and um, we have uh, monthly trainings and then we respond to whatever calls that we might get. Um, so we have uh, vehicle fires sometimes or wildland fires or even structural fires. We've had a structural fire here at the border in one time when someone's vehicle that they were driving out in the back country caught debris and then when they parked outside the hotel room that caught on fire and the fire spread from their vehicle into the hotel room so it was kind of a bizarre episode but um, and then we've got all sorts of medical emergencies that that happen around and and there there just aren't very many people who have interest or um, ability to respond to those so since I'm um, have some interest and, and ability I'm, I'm happy to help out when I can um, we also have uh, various other projects going on around town so uh, every third week of June, we hold a big um, Snake Valley Festival, and the festival raises water for the Great Basin Water Network to help protect our water resources here, um, because the, we don't want them to be going down to Southern Nevada, because we have so little water here, we, we really treasure the small amount we have. Um, and so we have this um, two to three day festival that includes parades, uh, it has um, booths where people can buy foods or arts and crafts there. There are live music, uh, parades, a water fight, um, and ice cream social, lots of food. Um, but we really focus on the water part because we want to bring awareness that the water is precious in all parts of Nevada. But in eastern Nevada, we have a really limited supply. 
and we don't want that to be taken away by Southern Nevada Water Authority and stuck to the south because we have so little of it here. And if they start pumping and decreasing the water table, our springs will go dry, so the wildlife will disappear. And we have a bit, lot of hunters that come to this area and, and we don't want that hunting revenue to totally disappear. Plus we don't want the animals to be dying because they don't have any water. Um, it'll also affect ranches because just a, a small two foot decrease in the water table would dry up a lot of the springs that not only the wildlife, but the, the cows um, are using. Plus it would make a big change in um, growing crops. Um, when I first got here, I was like, wow, what are those, those round things out there? I didn't even know what a pivot was. Um, and since then I've learned, but all, what's really interesting here in the Great Basin is that all the water comes off the mountains. Um, it's used to irrigate and then it goes down into um, the ground. And although it doesn't connect to the ocean, it does go different places. And in this area, it flows up to um, the Great Salt Lake Desert and is eventually discharged towards the Great Salt Lake. And so if that water is taken out from here, we could have um, less water in other places, which might dry up places and there could be huge dust storms that would blow lots of uh, dust. Um, and the, the prevailing winds would blow that dust right into the Wasatch Front. And, uh, um, that would really affect the air quality there where they already have poor air quality. Um, so the, the project of sucking the, the aquifers down around this area just isn't sustainable because we don't have much water here. And if um, Las Vegas starts building more homes to use the water here and then this water runs out, they're gonna have an even bigger problem because the, the, they won't have more water here to take from and they'll have to find it somewhere else and have to drain another part of Nevada. So it's just not a, a sound project, plus it's ridiculously expensive. Um, so we want to bring all that attention um, to at the, the festival and there is information available about that. And, um, and it's a, a great way to bring awareness to this whole issue in a very fun way. And um, people can have a lot of fun and, and enjoy themselves while they're there. I know there's several ways people think about water in Nevada and obviously central Nevada's got more water than than uh, the southern part and there's a a thought pat pattern that there is a river that runs through Nevada and would provide plenty of water to to drain so that it would go to Las Vegas um, and not be a problem for the other parts of the state. Have they done studies on the water patterns in the various basins? There have been a lot of water studies and basically what they show is that if you start drilling down, you're gonna start drilling into water that is very old water um, that was here back when there, there were the ancient lakes in, in Nevada. And um, by state law, that's not allowed to be used because that's mining water. So you have to use water that can be replaced every year. And um, we have nowhere near the amount of water that's say over in the Sierra Nevada. Our mountains are, are tall here, but the amount of precipitation they get is, is pretty puny compared to the other side of the state. So um, it's just, there, there's not that much water available. So, so they've done studies on recharge. Mm -hmm. I know we're in a, this is, 2017. I know that we are uh, in northern Nevada. We have bypassed the drought at least for some years, um, but it doesn't seem like this area got as much snow uh, yeah. as northern Nevada did. So it would this be a typical um, Mount Wheeler, for example? I've seen Mount Wheeler with much, much more snow in May than there is now. It, would this be a year that you might be worried about, that your recharge would be less than, than it used to be? Well, um, what we've, I go and help with the, the snow surveys where we go out and we measure the depth of the snow in the winter. And um, but we're about 120% average. So we're better than our average year, but we're nowhere near the 200 to 300% that are in other parts of the state right now. We're also finding climate change has a big impact on the water and the snow because um, we have more rain coming in the spring and less snow. 
and the snow seeps into the ground slower and then has a longer recharge time, whereas the rain comes down quickly and um, that we may not have that water in the streams for as long if it comes down as rain. And it also melts off faster. So just in the time I've been here, we've gone from um, our peak uh, snow melt or stream flow um, has moved from mid-June to about Memorial Day weekend. So we're looking at over two weeks time change um, and when that water comes down. And so that, that's a huge difference and that doesn't allow as much water in the streams later in the, the summer for the fish that are there. It can also stress out other wildlife. And so it's not only that we don't have a whole lot of water here, but the climate change is t changing the timing of how we can use the water and so it's less available than it used to be. So when I first came out here to Baker, I didn't think I was going to stay very long, but the job worked out very well and then I met my husband and I found that we had a lot of commonalities between um, me working as an ecologist for the National Park Service and him working as a rancher for himself. Um, the ranchers take really good care of the land because they want to keep using it year after year and I found that he knew a lot more about the natural history of some of the things than the, some of the so-called experts um, because he was just out there seeing it every day. And so his love of the land um, it really impressed me and it made me um, have a deeper appreciation of what I was studying in the National Park. And so over time I've um, come to find that this is home. This is the place where I really want to stay. Um, we've had uh, children here and we want to raise them here because it's a great place. And one of the things that makes Baker so great is that it hasn't changed very much. Um, it's not that different than it was a hundred years ago. And there really are still about the same amount of people living here as there were a thousand years ago. And there aren't many places in this country or even in this world where you can find that, where things are fairly the same. I mean, true, we've got modern amenities like internet and, and ha paved highways, but um, we have still the great quiet out here. Um, it's wonderful to be able to go out and hike a trail and have it all to yourself. When we look up at the skies at night, we don't see a whole lot of light pollution and so we can still look up and, and find the, that Big Dipper and the North Star and some of the other constellations and look at the bright Milky Way. It's so bright out here at night and um, still feel like we're looking at it like the, the Native Americans did um, thousands of years ago. And so all of that combined makes this a fantastic place to be. And I feel really lucky to be living out here on Highway 50 in Baker. So in order to keep this area as great as it is, um, I feel like my responsibility is to study um, as much as I can while I'm working um, as an ecologist at the park and to have um, the highest integrity with the, the studies and to try to keep learning more about what's living out here and why it's living out here and how, what its relationship is with the land. Um, and then to help the community in whatever ways I can, um, being a volunteer on various organizations and, and um, trying to ensure that we have a good future for Baker and that we'll be able to make sure that in 100 years, this place will be um, even better than what it is now. So I feel like this is the place where I was meant to be because I had my studies where I learned the, the background of ecology and the environmental science. And here's a place where I get to apply it and get to share the knowledge that we're gaining um, through resource management newsletters and um, social media and photography and writing. And so it's just a, a wonderful place to be. It's been an honor, Gretchen, talking with you. Uh, it's amazing that we have so many wonderful women that are contributing to our quality of life in Nevada. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patty.